This podcast is featured on the Gun Rights Radio Network, podcasting freedom. And welcome to episode 57 of Shooting the Breeze, the formal gun podcast of WaltNPA.com. I am Walt White, and it's been quite a while since I've done one of these. Uh, in fact, I think uh, the last episode I recorded was way back in uh, November, and the last couple of episodes that I recorded were all done in my car. Uh, I have uh, a little strap mount kind of a tripod thingamabob that that velcros onto my uh, my passenger side visor and then i put a little flip cam on there and and record as i'm driving to and from different locations uh in many of those episodes i was either going to cabela's for something shooting related or i was on my way to a match and uh, the last couple of episodes wound up being just sort of a match overview <coughs> excuse me of some of the IDPA matches that I've been shooting. Uh, since you know, since that time, USPSA has more or less wound down completely. Uh, we are in hiatus here in Pennsylvania. It is February now. Next month in March, uh, local clubs will begin shooting again. So things will pick back up on the shooting front. Uh, I haven't been. I haven't taken a hiatus myself. I actually shifted my focus over to IDPA throughout the winter, and it's been a lot of fun. Uh, it's been a bit more challenging than I thought it would be. Uh, you know, it's it's one thing to think about shooting in the cold, but it's something totally different to be running around on snow and ice and, and trying to manipulate while your hands are really cold. And, uh, you know, it's it's amazing how much trigger control drops off when, you know, the, the very tips of your fingers are starting to, to numb down. So... The, the whole IDPA in the winter thing has been a lot of fun. It's, I think it's done a great job of keeping me sharp, uh, keeping me proficient throughout the winter. Uh, I haven't done any practicing. I, I really should be doing it, but with, uh, with the political climate the way it is right now, ammo shortages have been uh, very troublesome, especially for a guy that shoots uh, a lot of factory ammo, such as myself. And, you know, it's just been really difficult to make everything come together. But uh, I have been able to get out at least twice a month every month over the last you know three or four months and and shoot idpa so uh next month when uspsa picks back up i'll be shifting focus a lot of the clubs that i shot uh idpa throughout the winter i probably won't see them again until next winter i'll be shooting the the, the usual two uspsa matches per month that i did last year and i will also be mixing in uh, one IDPA match, and the one I'm going to be shooting most frequently or most regularly is uh, on a Lonnie Rod and Gun Club out in New Tripoli, Pennsylvania. They do they do a really nice match. They they charge fifteen dollars for registration fee. Some of the other clubs have bumped up to twenty dollar registration fees. I was really disappointed with that, but. Onaloni remain the same at fifteen dollars for registration. Uh, they generally run between eight and ten stages, uh, whereas some of the other clubs are running anywhere from like five to seven. So Onaloni is typically ahead of the curve in that sense. So when I when I shoot a matchup there, I'm not paying as much as some of the other the other clubs a lot closer to Philadelphia, and I feel as though I'm getting uh, more of my money's worth out of shooting Onaloni. So I'm going to continue shooting there, and uh, the match director. Who's, who's become uh, you know a nice friend of mine, is running uh, what he's calling Team Down Zero out of the club, which is basically a, a points-based system. You're awarded points based on performance at his matches. So, for instance, last month was the first Team Down Zero match. Uh, registration is free. You sign up on his website. And what he does is he takes the overall rankings for the IDPA match and... The first member, or you know, the the first member on the list gets the most points, and then you know moves down. So if there's 20 t team down zero members shooting the match, the first place 
team down zero person. It doesn't really matter where they fall. It's, you know, it's just, as long as they're the highest on the list, they get maximum points. So in the overall list, if the first town team down zero point team down zero member is say sixth place overall he is still the first place team down zero member and therefore gets all 20 points or gets 20 points one point for each member shooting the second person down in line whether he's seventh overall or 12th overall receives 19 points and then 18 points and 17 so on and so forth and the way this works is since <clears throat> since it's based on your overall position your how much you beat or lose someone lose to someone by becomes less relevant it actually becomes a lot less relevant because it's your the the points that you earn aren't based on on that so if uh say for instance if i shoot a match and i play sixth overall first out of the team down zero members and the next person in line uh, places 10th overall second team down zero member uh I've got 20 points, he's got 19 points, for example, and now it's a really close race uh, back and forth. So if I miss a match, or he misses a match, or she misses a match, there could be a very big points discrepancy. And, and because of how this system works, I think it, there's going to be a lot of little battles back and forth for position. And I think it's going to make for a very fun season. Uh, there are 10 matches scheduled at Onolani throughout uh, 2013. Eight of those will be scored. Uh, Dave's going to take your two worst and wipe them out. So it's it should be com pretty competitive. The only thing I don't like about it so far is that it's retroactive. So if, if you come in and you sign up late, you still get points for matches that you've shot prior to sign up. You know, uh, it bumped me from first place in the standings to second place in the standings. So maybe that makes me a little bit more biased, especially since I, I got bumped for less than a half a second. But, uh, you know, I... I I would have liked to have seen either it not be retroactive or there be a penalty applied. You know, I, I think that uh, the people that signed up one time and, you know, are shooting throughout should be rewarded. And uh, anyone that comes in and signs up late should kind of be penalized. And, and the reason I think that is because, you know, if someone comes in halfway through the season, they sign up, all of a sudden it's retroactive and all those other, all of those other matches sort of all suddenly become tabulated. It it can really throw things off completely and I'm, I'm a person that likes to look at the numbers and see the standings and, and understand where I'm at and why and suddenly if you throw someone into the mix and it's retroactive and all kinds of things get screwed up then my previous record taking is suddenly irrelevant you know it doesn't really matter because everything's all jumbled you've got people in positions where I didn't place them and and I go as far as keeping a, a spreadsheet of how everyone performs so that I can see how I shot versus everyone else and now I have to go in and, and edit it because other people were added in retroactively which isn't a really big deal but it's just one of those things little minor annoyances but uh, it's a good program overall and I'm really looking forward to shooting throughout 2013 at Onolani. Before we get started with the news there was one other item I wanted to talk about a little bit and that is that in future episodes, I'm actually going to get a little bit of help. I was talking to a longtime listener and commenter and Facebook interactor guy, uh, John Stein, who is somewhat local. Uh, he shoots a lot of steel, or steel challenge, steel matches, and there's some overlap actually in the clubs that he shoots steel and the clubs that I shoot IDPA and USPSA. So uh, one of these months, we really need to get together and and, sh and shoot a match together, whether or not it's uh, USPSA, IDPA, or or steel challenge but uh, John's in the process of putting together some video for me discussing his first uh, action pistol sort of shoot it's it was kind of IDPA esque it was more like a fun shoot which was which from the sounds of it was uh, modeled sort of after IDPA I don't know I'll, I'll know more when I see the when I see the video when it's finished but uh, I'm really eager to see John put together something for that uh, I'm looking forward to sharing that maybe in the future we can do a little bit more um, in the past for Stogie Review I've done plenty of video where we do kind of side-by-side -side, uh, discussion interaction kind of a thing and I think that would be really cool to mix in at some point so you know that's kind of on the agenda for something that I want to do but uh, in the very near future we have uh, John coming on to do a video segment on his first action pistol match versus what he's done in the past with steel challenge so that should be a lot of fun really interesting and uh, i'm looking forward to seeing it hopefully you are too <laughs> the
The first item in the news comes from CNN Money, and this has to do with Walmart. It's entitled, As Firearm Sales Soar, Walmart Ration Sale of Ammunition. Now, this comes after the initial rumors that Walmart was halting the sale of uh, ammunition and firearms. Right before uh, the president gave his press conference on gun control, there was uh, a lot of rumors circulating that Walmart was going to halt the sale of, of firearms and ammunition because they didn't know what was going to be forthcoming after the, the president's press conference, what was going to be involved with the with the uh, the executive actions and things like that. So there was uh, a lot of rumors flying around. They turned out to be false, but a lot of major blogs picked up on the news story and, and things just became hectic. Uh, Ammunition was already in high demand at Walmart when when those rumors started circulating it it got it went to an all-time high So uh, this particular news article goes on to say the nation's largest retailer is limiting ammunition sales at its stores across the country To three boxes per customer per day Guns and ammunition have been flying off store shelves since President Obama's re-election in November And the firearm rush only picked up in the wake of the tragic shooting in Newtown, Connecticut in December more and more people are buying guns while they have the chance, since many are worried that their right to buy assault weapons could be curtailed with gun control legislation. The increased demand has hit Walmart, Walmart supply. Right now we're monitoring supply issues daily since supply is limited at this time, said Ashley Hardy, a Walmart spokesperson. We're trying to take care of as many customers as possible and we're working with suppliers to put product back on the shelves. Hardy said that the purchase limit will stay in place until the retailer is able to resolve the shortage. Gun sales soared following the presidential election and kept pace in the wake of the Sandy Hook shooting. Uh, goes on and on, more or less the same, and then we kind of get into like uh, an anti-gun kind of diatribe. But <clears throat> the the meat and potatoes of the story is that Walmart will be limiting su ammo supply to three boxes of ammunition per customer per day and the, uh, this was actually some news that I got ahead of time I have uh, like a network of friends and family that uh, keep an eye on Walmart supplies for me uh, because I shoot primarily factory ammunition uh, I buy a lot of my ammo actually I buy all of my ammo through Walmart uh, the, and quite honestly there's no reason not to uh, when Back when I, back before the hundred round value packs of Federal became really popular, I could walk into a Walmart store and at any time pick up a box of 50 rounds of 9mm. Uh, it just looks like a standard box of ammunition. There's a plastic housing inside and each round stands up in the little plastic housing. It, you know, there's really nothing fancy to the packaging. It's just, you know, individually packaged sort of 50 rounds of ammunition. And the cost was about $12 a box. Now, when Walmart started selling bulk packs of 100 rounds of Federal Premium, the price was like $19.95 per 100. The only difference, uh, at the time, they, they were packaged a little different. Now, they're kind of packaged like the, the Winchester White Box, where it's just a box of ammunition with loose rounds dumped in it. Uh, the Federal has like a... A cardboard sleeve in between layers so you get a couple layers of ammunition in this box and basically it's just a cardboard box filled with nine millimeter ammunition and there was a major price difference you could buy two boxes of 50 for 24 dollars or one box of 100 for 1995 you know there was a, a difference of four dollars per hundred i mean it would you'd be crazy if you weren't looking for the 100 round value packs so that's what i did i had uh, friends and family keeping an eye on store shelves and when I could find someone that worked at Walmart to purchase them for me, you know, the added 10% discount was just icing on the cake. Uh, you know, buy, even if I were to walk into a store and buy the 100 round value packs, I'm paying pretty much the same as I would ordering bulk online, only I can buy it local, I can buy it in less quantity, and I'm not paying shipping. So after you factor in the shipping charges and tax it's more or less the same you know there was really no reason for me to be ordering ammo online and it's uh you know i buy as much of it as i can uh it's just a great value i think now you have to you have to work a bit at it if you want if you want to get it because you know supply is really limited and uh it's tough to come by but 
because I'm, I'm early to rise, you know, early to bed, early to rise kind of a person, I get up really early every morning. On, on New Year's Eve, me, me and my daughter were sound asleep by like 10 o'clock. My wife wasn't happy, but, uh, you know, we were sound asleep by like 10 o'clock on, on New Year's Eve. And a friend of mine got stuck working that night at Walmart. And I got a text message when my alarm went off at 4.30. And it said, basically, hey, we have a 1,000 rounds of 9mm that just came in. It's locked up in the back. You know, if you want it, you got to get here soon because it's going to hit the ammo case and I don't know how long it's going to last. So, because, fortunately, I had forgot to turn my alarm off because I wasn't working that day. And I got the text message early. I got up, I got showered, I got ready to go. And I was standing outside the Walmart at like... 5.45 a.m. waiting for them to open the doors at 6. I got inside. I got someone to get the ammunition for me from the back. I bought all 1,000 rounds in one shot. And that's just the type of thing you need to do to get uh, quantity from Walmart. Now that they're limiting sales to three boxes per person per day, it, it means that everyone else in the area will have... A, a, a better chance at getting ammunition. It's It kind of sucks for me because I want... You know, I'd I'd rather I'd rather get as much as I can in short little bursts than only be able to get one box here and you know one box two weeks later. You know, depending on you know how often the the, the stock is on the shelves. I mean, uh, you know, I, I really had to utilize my my Walmart network as it is, uh, but uh, it's it's worked out fairly well for me. Um, I think I have about a thousand rounds left. And uh, and I've got 2,000 rounds for for the USPSA season coming up, so I should be okay as long as uh, supply starts to, to fill back up. Uh, if if it continues as it is, it may get a little hairy toward the end of the season. Although I do have uh, reloading components, if I can find primers, I'm having an incredibly hard time finding primers so that I can get started with reloading. But that's something I want to talk a little bit about later. So first up in the news is Walmart rationing ammunition supplies or ammunition sales. The second and final piece of news comes from GunSaveLives.com and it is entitled Shotgun Wielding Ex-Boyfriend is Disarmed, Comes Back with Second Shotgun, Is Shot and Killed. Goes on to say, according to Gainesville.com, a homeowner's ex-boyfriend forced his way into her home armed with a shotgun. People inside the home managed to disarm the man after he fired one shot inside the home. The suspect then fled the scene. The occupants of the home called 911, but before police could respond, the suspect returned with a second shotgun. This time, the homeowner and another male inside the home were armed with handguns and shot the suspect multiple times. He died of his injuries at, at an area hospital. No one inside the home was injured. So, uh, kind of a short and sweet news story here, and maybe I'm preaching to the choir here, but uh, this is kind of a a great example of why you know guns should be in the home and people should be using them to protect themselves. Uh, I'm not quite sure how the suspect managed to get away. I you know I guess in in the in the panic that ensued after a, a round was discharged in the home, the suspect wound up getting away. Uh, 911 was dialed, dispatch had police on the way, and this guy had enough time to leave the premises and come back with a second shotgun to attack these individuals. And, uh, you know, the police were still on their way. As they say, you know, it, when, when seconds count, the police are minutes away. You know, not to, to put down the police or anything, but uh, people really need to be prepared to fend for themselves in dangerous situations. Uh, we can't always rely on police to come and protect us. This is, uh, unfortunately... You, you know, so something nasty like this happens, you know, to, to good people all the time. Now, fortunately, these people were prepared to defend themselves, and uh, they were able to to stop the suspect from hurting or killing them. So, I guess there's a there's a there's a good part to the story, and that's that uh, the innocent lives were saved, and no one was hurt, or at least none of the good guys were hurt. In an effort to save time this episode, I'm only going to do one piece of featured content. And this was something that I watched on television last week or so. Uh, I started getting word or hearing hearing about uh, Joshua Prince, who's an area attorney, uh, civil rights attorney, 
Uh, he was going to make an appearance on a television show called Community Consensus, which is uh, it's a, it's a Berks County local television series or television show where it's it's kind of like a debate format where several individuals are are brought in and a community discussion is is formed. And uh, there were a number of people involved, uh, quite a few actually. At least eight people are in the little screenshot of the the video that I'm looking at, and uh, there was a pretty even split, uh, you know, pro pro gun rights and anti gun sides, and there was a lot of discussion back and forth. Uh, fortunately, the pro gun side was out in force, and I think they dominated the discussion, and I think that's fantastic. There were a couple of little hiccups in the in the discussion that I thought were kind of odd. There's uh, one area mayor described himself as as a hunter, uh, pro-gun, but he's also a member of Bloomberg's Mayors Against Illegal Guns. I'm not quite sure how you can be both, but he is, and you know he claims that he is only against illegal guns. And his angle was that you know he's a hunter and he's pro-gun and he appreciates guns and firearms and he's okay with them until they're made illegal. And it was the way he was talking, it was almost as if he was just sort of evilly sitting there, clacking his fingers together, waiting for guns to become illegal so that he could pounce on them. Uh, there was uh, a mayor, a mayor of Boyertown, another area in, not far from me. The the mayor there was talking about how you know the Constitution was written back in the 1700s. Times have changed. Perhaps we need to change the times. She's also pro-gun. You know, grew up in a in a gun household and you know ar around a gun community. Kind of odd, but uh, but yeah, she went that route and said, you know, times have changed, so things need to change. Uh, there was another mayor, which I thought was kind of amusing. <clears throat> the mayor of Hamburg is is anti-gun. Now, the amusing thing there is Hamburg sort of thrives around the the local Cabela's. Uh, in Berks County, Cabela's is the mecca for gun sales. Uh, they, you know, they just sell tremendous number of guns, ammunition, you know, hunting supplies, reloading supplies, like anything that involves guns. Cabela's is the dominant force in Berks County. Actually, I think they're the dominant force in the entire state. And here is Hamburg, this little town that's that probably half the community is employed by either Cabela's or the area businesses that thrive off of Cabela's traffic. You know, you've got people coming in from New Jersey, from the surrounding counties. Everyone's going to Cabela's because it's sort of the, the hot spot if you're looking for, you know, firearms or hunting supplies, uh, any outdoor stuff. People are flocking to Cabela's to purchase purchase that stuff. And it's amazing that the guy that leads the community that thrives off of Cabela's is anti-gun, so that I thought was kind of amusing. The The pro-gun side was fantastic. Uh, the Berks County Sheriff was on, uh, Sheriff Weeknick, who has done uh, a tremendous, just tremendous things for gun rights in Berks County. He's simplified the process. It is uh, really easy to get a gun here, or uh, uh, I'm sorry, a license to carry here. And it takes about 15 minutes. He's, he's set up satellite offices, so if you can't get to the county courthouse or the, the county conve county courthouse just isn't convenient for you, there's a satellite office set up in the old uh, Reading Airport. There are there are a couple of uh, other satellite offices that are only open a couple of days a month in the, in the surrounding township buildings. So he's he's gone a long way into making things easier. Uh, Joshua Prince, the attorney did a very good job discussing uh his his take on on pro gun legislation i thought that was that was really good he he countered a lot of the arguments made by the anti gun folks uh one of the interesting things that he said was that in this state if you get 302 which is uh an involuntary uh involuntarily committed uh, for instance if you're if you're overdosing or something like that and you and and the doctor feels as though you are a danger to yourself or others they can involuntarily commit you in the event that that form is signed there is there's no due process you're pretty much stripped away of your rights uh it, and one of those rights is to to own firearms and uh, i thought it was really interesting and i wasn't aware that there's just no due process there you're your rights are stripped away based on a doctor's signature and he he talks a little bit about multiple cases where people are wrongly 302'd uh, you know based on just a doctor's 
swiping a swiping a pen over a piece of paper. And I thought that that was that was pretty interesting. I, I would have loved to have heard more, but he was just very brief on that. Uh, the there was a chief of police there who was very pro gun. Uh, just a, it was just a, a really good good television show. Uh, you know, it's it's kind of local community access you know the the video isn't the video quality isn't so great the sound quality isn't so great but the discussion was great I, you know i thought it was really good and it's well worth watching it's uh about an hour long and you know I th if you're pro gun i think you'll enjoy it you know there, there are a couple of laughs as uh as the pro guys the pro gun guys really uh take it to the anti-gun crowd so definitely worth watching if you've got a spare hour to kill in past episodes, I've done uh, cigar and drink pairing as uh, kind of an off-topic, little fun way to discuss another hobby of mine. And I kind of want to pare that down a little bit and dump the, the drink pairing portion of it. Because it seems like every time I do these podcasts, I'm doing the same thing. I'm, I'm drinking coffee or water or, or something like that. I don't really get into drinking uh, different spirits or anything like that so it's just easier to pair out the what will most of the time be coffee since i drink a lot of the same stuff and we'll just do uh you know a, a cigar recommendation from here on out and the recommendation this episode is the oliva siri v liga especial maduro 2012 it's it's a handful but it's uh it's a fantastic cigar several years back i think it's four or five years ago Oliva branched out and extended their Liga Especial line, which is which was a very popular mid-priced premium cigar. Uh, I think the cost at that point in time was between six and seven dollars per single, and they released this Maduro version, and it was leaps and bounds better than the original Liga. Siri V. Uh, I, I just I fell in love with that cigar. It was fantastic. Uh, the The early shape was only or it was only available as a bellicoso or a torpedo with a with a tapered head. And the only issue I've ever had with that cigar is that Oliva tends to make their torpedo shaped cigars a bit tight. Uh, I'm just never really happy with the draw on them. But the flavors were just so fantastic. I kept buying them. And the following year, the cigars weren't quite as good as the first year, but they were still well worth the $8 that they were charging for them. Somewhere along the lines, uh, another version was released, and I think it had a, a Maduro wrapper on it, and it was terrible. I sort of gravitated away from the line after that <laughs> until the following year when uh, a Parejo shape was released, which is basically just a, a round cap. And that cigar was fantastic. And since then, they've been doing these Parejo-shaped cigars. And I'm glad they got away from the, the Torpedo shape, that Bellicoso shape, because just these draw so much better. Now, the first year that they released the Parejo shape, it was just fantastic. It was, you know, kind of a cigar of the year candidate. It was just, it was just that good. This year, it's been so long since I've had the 2011 V Maduro that I can't really remember whether I like that one better or less than this year's release but the 2012s are fantastic the price has gone up they're about nine and a half dollars per single but I think they're well worth it uh, they are limited I, I don't remember how many thousand boxes are released but uh, they should be readily available for the next month or two before availability starts tapering off because supply is going to taper off but it's most definitely worth trying if you're into Maduro cigars. Uh, it's got a similar profile to the, the, the standard Liga Especial if you like those, but it's got more hearty, earthy tones. Uh, it's got some bitterness to it. The, the Maduro flavor really shines in these. And they aren't over the top. They're medium bodied, medium to full. And uh, the finish is nice and easy on the palate. They're not overwhelming. They're not going to be too much. And they pair really well with either coffee or my favorite, which is uh, Samuel Smith's Oatmeal Stout. Or uh, or who makes the Founders, found, Founders Breakfast Stout or Samuel Smith's Oatmeal Stout. Both are just incredible with the cigar. They, they work really, really well. But uh, really solid cigars for nine and a half dollars. They're well worth spending the money, you know, for that occasional treat. Uh, if you're interested in trying these cigars, you can purchase them from my preferred retailer, which is Buckhead Cigar down in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, you can pick up the phone and give Mike a call at 404-844-0400. 
Tell Mike you're looking for the, the new Siri V Maduro that came out this year. And uh, he'll package you up either a five pack or a box and send it out to you. Uh, he doesn't do online sales, but you can check out some of the new stuff that he has either on sale or is featured at askthecigarguys.com. Mike is also on Twitter and Facebook as Buckhead Cigar. So look up Mike, place an order, and let him know that Walt sent you. The discussion topic this episode is reloading. I kind of hinted on that earlier on, but if you are or were a faithful watcher or listener and you remember a while ago, maybe shortly after Father's Day last year, I went out and I ordered a Lee Progressive Press, a Lee Pro 1000 set up in 9mm. Uh, this particular press is uh, its kind of a budget model uh, put out by Lee and it's set up so that it kind of comes out of the box ready to load one caliber and I think it was about $200. Uh, I had read a lot of different things about this press. I looked at some uh, YouTube reviews and the consensus seemed to be split. Half the people that owned the press really enjoyed it and liked it. The other half absolutely hated it. But because I was on a budget, I decided that I was going to live with the quirks of the press, uh, put an order in, and get reloading with this Lee Pro 1000. So I put the order in, I got the press, I set it down in my basement, I kind of put it on the back burner, and I waited on ordering the rest of the supplies, uh, digital calipers, scale, media tumbler, <coughs> miscellaneous things like that. And it just kind of stayed on the back burner. <clears throat> it wasn't until much, much later, actually fairly recently, that uh, the ammo supply started to dry up and I decided, okay, I'm definitely going to start reloading over the winter. That was the, that was the plan. And I'm finally going to get off my ass and order the rest of those supplies. So I went to Facebook and I started posting questions and my gun buddies were there in a heartbeat giving me tips and information on what to order, what to get, what to look for things of that nature. And I started ordering the components. I ordered uh, a media tumbler, tumbler. I tumbled about 2,700 rounds of 9mm. Uh, those are all clean and ready to go. I ordered 1,147 grain bullets from Black Bullets International. I ordered uh, scale digital calipers. I am ready to go. The only thing I didn't order was uh, primers and powder. I decided I was going to buy those local to save on hazmat fees and I thought it would be just a little bit easier being able to go, at a, go to a store, look around and purchase whatever I needed. Now there were some quirks. Uh, there were some issues right off the bat. Uh, Black Bullet International, they produce bullets that have a coating on them. Uh, it's, it's basically so that uh, the rounds don't let up your barrel too much. Molly or some sort of poly coating on them. And they recommend using uh, the slower burning powders. Uh, they say that you know some of the fast, high reactive stuff will work just fine. It will just smoke more, I guess, because the the coating will burn a bit. But I decided to kind of play it safe, and I was going to look for the recommended slower powders. Uh, one of them was uh, Universal Clays or Clays, and I had a really hard time finding it. Uh, and to compound that and make things even more difficult, the Lee Progressive Press recommends only CCI or Winchester primers. I don't remember whether they're Winchester or Remington, but they recommend these harder primers. And the reason is that apparently they, they say to stay away from Federal because they're softer primers. And in the event that one primer detonates from being crushed in the press or something, all of the all the other primers in the tray are in close proximity and Federal has, uh, I forget how they described it, but they're more susceptible to detonation due to another primer detonating nearby. So they recommend staying away from Federal primers. Now, th the issue was that I can't find anything but Federal primers in the area. And actually, and the Federal primers that I found, the store only had 200 of them, so I didn't bother buying any at all. And getting powder was nearly impossible. Uh, I, I made two trips to Cabela's, I hit up all of the local stores, all except for one, and I just couldn't get primers and powders and it was kind of getting frustrating. Finally, on a whim, I went up to Cabela's last week and they were just, they, apparently they had just got a shipment of powder and they were loading it up on the shelves and I picked up a pound of clays. So I have bullets and powder and 
a press and the rest of the stuff that I need that goes along with it, but I don't have any primers at the moment. And it looks like I'm going to be able to get federal primers. I've got a friend that's going to pick them up from King Shooter Supply for me. But, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of concerned with using them in the press. Well, now I'm kind of on the fence. I'm thinking about ordering a a Dillon Square Deal B set up in 9mm. Um, the press is twice the price. I don't really have the money for it. However, we just did our income tax so that my wife could fill out some uh, financial aid stuff for student loans. And we're getting a little bit more money back than we were anticipating. So I'm thinking about ordering the Dillon and then selling off the, the Lee Pro that's still in the original box and using whatever I make on that press to pay it pay down on whatever I pay for the Dillon. So it looks like I may invest $400 on a Dillon square deal in 9mm and then try to sell my Lee Pro. If I paid 200 for it, maybe I can get 175 if I'm lucky and then sort of pay down on the Dillon. So I, I'm kind of on the fence. I'm going to be reloading really soon, one way or the other. Whether or not I have to use that press is kind of, uh, I don't know, it's, it's kind of up in the air. And the reason why I'm, I'm considering getting away from the Lee is because I talked to at least three different people locally that are giving me horror stories about this press. Uh, one guy had the press for a very short period of time, had nothing but problems with it, and ended up selling it or returning it or something and getting a Dylan in return has been super happy with it. Um, another guy's telling me that he, he's able to load about 100 rounds before the press has to be broken down and cleaned, otherwise it doesn't, it starts acting up and doesn't work quite right. So knowing that I'm going to load between two and 300 rounds for a given match in a given, in a given sitting, you know, I don't want to have to break the press down two to three times to be able to do that with that Lee Pro 1000. Um, on, on the flip side, I have heard some positive stories. Uh, some people have, have found fixes for the quirks in the press. But at the moment, I, I'm just not quite sure what I want to do. Uh, when I get those primers, I'll make a decision. If I can find CCI primers, maybe I'll stick with the Lee. If uh, reloading components continue to be as difficult to find as they are right now. I think when that when the income tax return comes in, I'm going to order a, a Dillon and go that route instead of trying to deal with the quirks of the of the Lee. Um, it's not an ideal situation by any stretch, but I think that going with the Dillon and, you know, cry once, buy once mentality will will save me some frustration later on. And, uh, you know, that Lee press has always been in the back of my mind a starter press. If I decided I, I liked reloading and it was what I wanted to do, I was going to upgrade at some point in time anyway. Whether or not it was a Dylan, that really hadn't crossed my mind. It was either going to be uh, a Hornady in RCBS or, uh, or a Dylan upgrade at some point in time. But uh, I think I may make that upgrade sooner so that it gives me a little bit more flexibility at least with the primers, and, and that seems sort of like an, in, an, ins an insignificant reason to upgrade the press, but just the combination of limited supplies and problems with with the, the supplies that are available and the, the horror stories I'm hearing about the press, it's just, it's making me think that maybe I should just bite the bullet, get the Dylan, and sell off the, the lead to fund it after the fact. So. Uh, that's kind of where I'm at. I definitely will be reloading sooner than later. I've got all the components sitting around. It's just a matter of uh, getting some primers and getting underway. Well, I think that's about going to do it for episode 57 of Shooting the Breeze, the formal gun podcast of WaltNPA.com. I want to thank you for watching, downloading, subscribing, you know, the iTunes reviews, things like that. All of that goes a very long way, and I, I really appreciate everything that everyone has done to support me and the podcast along the way. My, apologi my apologies for the long lapse in, in this episode and the last one, but hopefully moving forward we can get this, uh, we can get the rhythm back and start posting these on a regular basis. With, uh, with the weather turning and things getting nicer, I hope to be able to do a bit more with, uh, with getting some additional people you know, on, on the podcast. Uh, I would really like to do some shooter profiles going forward. Uh, I, I really enjoy competitive shooting and there's a lot of great people in the area. Uh, one of the things that I would really like to do going forward is uh, just kind of sit down with them a little bit and talk, you know, talk shop or talk uh, talk shooting with them. Uh, 
ideally, I, you know, I would really like to get to talk to some match directors, uh, you know, some shooters in the area, get their take on, on the shooting sports, how they break down stages, how they do this, how they do that, training routines, things like that. Uh, I don't want to turn this into a competitive shooting podcast because I think there are enough of them out there. And uh, I, I think my audience is basically uh, general firearms related. So I don't want to get too far into the competitive shooting realm, but it is something that I want to add to the fold. So Again, thanks for checking out episode 57 of Shooting the Breeze. Head on over to the Gun Rights Radio Network. Uh, check out the other shows on the network. And, uh, you know, give them a little love, too. So, again, thanks for watching. And until next time, stay safe and take it easy. You can hear Gun Rights Radio Network on Stitcher Smart Radio. Stitcher allows you to listen to your favorite shows directly from your iPhone, Android phone, BlackBerry, or Palm phone. On demand and on the go. Don't have Stitcher? Download it for free today at Stitcher.com or in the app stores. Stitcher Smart Radio, the smarter way to listen to radio. Gun Rights Radio Network shows can be found under sources.